Com, first day MBAA 2017, not a big newsmaker, just a lot of expectation of good things to come, and one of those good things to come is a certified PC-24. When When is it going to be, and more important, when do we get to fly it? Exactly, yeah, well, it's uh, we're approaching certification. Uh, we just uh, crossed over 2,000 hours in the flight test program. We are confident we'll have it in December of this year, so we'll have the first handover of the first PC-24 to Plane Sense in December right after that. This has been a long process, and at the same time, you had a stake in the market that was a stranglehold on rough and ready, go fast, go far, land anywhere type airplanes. The 24 was a whole different aspect of a mold that you developed. Are you happy with where you're at? Yeah, definitely, and it's interesting you say that because the first reaction a lot of people had when we introduced the 24 is, what is Pilatus doing making a twin engine jet? You know, you've always made single engine turboprops. And I just ask people, just stop, think about what the PC-12 does, what the Porter does, all that utility, the cargo door, the off runway performance. When we polled and, and surveyed a lot of our customers, all they wanted was to go faster. And we thought, well, 20 knots faster, 50 knots faster, how do we differentiate it from the PC-12? We settled on 150 knots faster. So then we looked at single engine turboprops, twin engine turboprops, single engine jets, and ultimately realized that the best configuration for that is a twin engine jet. So think of it as a 50% larger PC-12 that goes 150 knots faster. And that's how it fits into our lineage or our brand, if you will. What were some of the surprises in the 24 development program? From what I understand, you learned a lot from this airplane. Oh yeah, you know, we were talking about that the other day. I was asking some of our engineers, you know, as we went through the development program, that exact question. And the answer was, well, nothing really. The biggest thing that surprised them was just the sheer amount of data and information you need to supply to the authorities anymore to achieve certification. That being said, EASA and FAA were very cooperative in the process. Two of the biggest challenges, if you will, or, or you could say they are challenges because they're new with the aircraft, was that huge speed range with the airplane. 81 knot stall speed on one end and a 425 knot cruise speed on the other end. So that was the first technical challenge, but we had, we had been working on this airplane for over 10 years internally. So we had done enough computational fluid dynamics. We developed our own airfoil. We have double, double slotted Fowler flaps. Really, flight test was a verification that, okay, all, what we had designed is correct. And you can see there are no stall fences, no vortex generators, no winglets. The other big challenge that took us a number of years to figure out, but we didn't go ahead until we had a solution, was the cargo door. I've heard through the grapevine a lot of people questioning whether we could get that certified, but that was one of those key technologies where we didn't go forward until we had a solution. And now that we've done all the structural testing and flight testing, it's borne out. How will this airplane be deployed? What are you looking to do with the first few airplanes? And more important, what kind of arrangements are you making with initial operators to make sure that one, you're in contact, and two, you're learning what you need to do for 24s down the line? Yeah, yeah. and that's the nice thing is that you, know, you don't start off on day one with 100 brand new airplanes in the field. You know, we've committed to 84 airplanes. That's the only block that we've opened up for sale. That block is sold both to individual operators and fleet operators and then those 84 will be delivered over the next two and a half years and essentially getting back on to the original schedule. So by mid-2020, those 84 airplanes will be delivered. The nice thing is of those 84 orders, we had originally anticipated that maybe 15% would be coming from existing PC-12 owners. It ended up being just the opposite. 85% of those orders are from existing PC-12 operators. So we know them, they know us. We feel like we have a good partnership to learn from them as it enters into service, stay close to them and their operations and make sure they don't they don't miss a, miss a beat. Uh, what kind of future do you see for the airplane and more important, where do you go from there? Sure. Yeah, well, you just keep adding 12 and you get a new uh, Pilatus <laughs> model, right? So, yeah. Well, um, one of the things we are, you know, a private company, we don't do things quarter to quarter. And we also believe in extreme long-term employment. If we hire somebody, we're committing employment to them for life. Our CEO, Marcus Buecher, made a comment in yesterday's press conference that Pilatus hasn't laid anybody off in 26 years. So we've been through at least three pretty significant economic cycles in the industry. Part of the way we do that is we don't build 
production to just peak and sell in one year or two years and then the program's done in five. We carefully watch the market. We see how many airplanes are getting retailed by our, our dealer associates and we'll adjust production based on that so we don't flood the market. So that helps retain resale value for, for the airplanes. It also evens out production over time. So with the 24 in that $10 million price category, you've got some other competitors. There's unique things about the PC-24, but I don't see that we'll ever, you know, we're not gonna build 100 airplanes in a year, even if demand is there. We also wanna keep steady employment in Switzerland. We're balancing off half of our business, our military trainers, and then the PC-12 as well. So we hope this will be a good, very long-term product offering for Pilatus and, and our customers and help retain their resale value. For the first airplanes coming off the line, when you start talking to the pilots and the people who will be operating them, what is the thing that you think will wind up being the distinguishing factor in how they evaluate the airplane? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, people will start comparing specs. And the first reaction somebody may have is, okay, it's 10 or 20 knots slower than something else in the price range. But the reason for that is you get it back on the approach end. You know, it's an 81 knot stall speed. You know, it's a 17 some thousand pound airplane. So what that does is it allows people access to many more runways. We've calculated about double the number of, of runways when you factor in the short distance and whether it's grass or gravel. So we think it's really gonna create a new paradigm in flight operations about how you can use this, whether it's in a corporate operation or charter, all of a sudden there are a lot of places you can go to. It's 2,700 foot balance field length at, at gross weight. I mean, and you've got a giant cargo door that you can, you can throw things in. So it's not only been corporate operators, a number of government and special mission operators and air ambulance entities are looking at this. And we've got a lot of potential markets uh, that we're eager to explore with it. Tom, opening day, MBAA 2017. Thanks for spending some time with us. Aero TV is brought to you by... Today's pilots must have power for electronic flight bags, tablets, iPads, and communication devices. The TA-102 dual USB charging port delivers more power with less hassles. Available from your local avionics dealer. The Bristel Light Sport Aircraft is what you are looking for. The Bristel is wider than a Cirrus, faster than a Skyhawk, offers more storage than a Husky, and comes standard with Garmin Avionics. So what are you waiting for? Visit Bristel.com to find out how you can get into a Bristel today.